Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Roderick Long. He's professor of philosophy at Auburn University, director and president of the Molinari Institute, a senior fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society, and a regular contributor to Libertarianism.org. His new book is Rituals of Freedom, Libertarian Themes in Early Confucianism. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Hi. Thank you. Good to be here. So I wanted to start not with Confucianism but actually with, with something you mentioned right at the beginning of the book um, which may be slightly more familiar to our audience which is Taoism. Um, a lot of libertarian works, um, the, the Libertarian Mind by our colleague David Bowes for example begins by saying the earliest libertarian thinker uh, we can see at work in, in Taoism is Lao Tzu and you – Begin by pushing back on that, by saying that's not quite right, that not only is, is Confucianism a better fit for that, but that the interpretations of Taoism we get from libertarians are not accurate. So can you tell us maybe what Taoism is first and how libertarians get it wrong? OK. Well, I mean Taoism and Confucianism are two of the earliest schools of Chinese thought. Exactly how early Lao Tzu is is a matter of controversy because traditionally he's dated to the 6th century BC or thereabouts, um, which is one reason that you know, to the extent that he's a libertarian thinker, he's often thought to be the first because he's so early. But the, the modern view is that probably his book, the Tao Te Ching, dates from something closer to the 4th or 3rd century BC, so that actually it's, it's a little later. So even to whatever extent he is libertarian, he's not you know, he's not the first. Uh, he got Confucians before him, but um, uh, I'm certainly there is a strong anti-statist, anti-authoritarian strain in the Taoists. Uh, I don't deny that, but the there's also a kind of anti-civilization theme in the Taoists. Uh, a tendency to think, for example, Lao Tzu says that the ideal, uh, the ideal society would be one in which people live in in little villages. And they have lost the art of writing, and so they only uh, keep records by tying knots and string. And they can hear the dogs barking and the roosters crowing in the next village over the hill, but they've never been over there. Um, and it, and more broadly, a kind of suspicion of conceptual thought, the idea that conceptual thought falsifies, that conceptual thought uh, misleads us, that language uh, misleads us, and uh, the idea that we should return to a kind of primitive simplicity, uh, you know, that we should be like an uncarved block. And you know, those are sentiments that most libertarians are not really that into. Most libertarians are, fa are fans of langu language and conceptual abstraction. They're fans of, of trade and uh, civilization and technology. And so that's a theme. Now, the Taoists are complicated, so you can find you could know, find strands and then they push in other directions. But the two main Taoists, Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu, both, you know, at least there is a strong primitivist element in them that may remind us more of, you know, more of Rousseau than of, uh, or one aspect of Rousseau, since he's also complicated. Um, and this, this kind of primitivist, anti civilization, anti rational uh, theme. Now, there are a lot of good things in the Taoists, too. I don't want to just come here and dump on the Taoists. But. I think that they are, you know, they are in, in many ways not as as close precursors for libertarianism as the Confucians are. What type of world, uh, if if it was Lao Tzu was in the third or fourth century, as you said, as scholars now think, were they living in for the, for the Taoists, and then also we can talk about this for the for Confucius in a state, a kind of thing that we would recognize as a modern state where maybe even if we apply libertarian concepts to them, we might be doing that illegitimately because they weren't really part of a government, more of a community, for example? Well, there were you – know, so what had happened, the Chinese philosophy arises in the wake of the collapse of the Zhou dynasty. And once you get – and when you go back to the Zhou dynasty, history starts becoming a little murky. Our recorded history really starts – around the time of its collapse. So we don't know that much about the details of the Zhou dynasty, but it collapsed and fragmented. And so you have a period where lots of new little states are popping up. You have, um, and uh, you have uh, 
you know, various, you know, generals and princes and so forth who are starting, you know, carving out new little states for themselves. So I think, I mean, I think they count as, as states more or less. I mean, they're territorial uh, monopolies, uh, you know, ruled by some jumped up prince or other. And really, Chinese philosophy starts from this because you have all these educators and scholars and bureaucrats who are suddenly, you know, wandering out of a job with the collapse of the previous dynasty. And they are, you know, and they're going to from 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 one to another of these little states offering their services as political advisors, and so you know, and two different political advisors show up at the same state, and they want to advise the prince what to do, and so they have to give arguments as to why the prince should listen to him rather than the other one. You start getting debates and so forth, and uh, the early period of Chinese philosophy seems to grow out of that context. So, yeah, I think that you know, it was a context of states, new states. Rapidly forming states, competing states, states in particular that are competing for population. These states were, you know, the new states were trying to get people to move from neighboring states to them. Uh, you know, it, it was, you know, they were <laughs> strongly encouraging immigration uh, because they wanted you know, more workers and more industry and so forth. And so one of the things that the these these uh, traveling scholars would do is try and and give the prince advice about what policies would attract more people into their states. Well, then I guess let's turn to Confucius then um, and maybe – so when was when was he and give us a bit about his background and character before we get into his thought. OK. Well, Confucius himself uh, lived uh, around the late 6th, early 5th century uh, BC and uh, he was one of these uh, – uh, displaced uh, scholars who you know, traveled around offering his services. And he started a movement that we call Confucianism. They didn't call themselves that. They called themselves uh, by a phrase that means something like the literati, as sometimes translated. Um, Confucius, Confucius himself, Kung, Kung Tzu or Kung Fu Tzu, um, what we have from him, and it's not clear whether it's something he wrote or whether it's something that was assembled by his his students. Um, what we have by him is, uh, you know, is very cryptic and elliptical. And um, uh, it, when, I, when I talk about Confucianism, really I have in mind less Confucius himself than the people in the next few centuries that came along and developed his thought and considered themselves continuators of Confucius. So. Uh, I have in mind a particular uh, Mengzi or Mencius, as he's sometimes called, uh, who was in the fourth century, Shunzi in the third century, and then the historian Sima Qian in the second century. When we're looking for libertarian ideas, that I think it's really in those three above all that we uh, find them. If you, you know, trying to figure out, you know, trying to get philosophical ideas out of Confucius himself is is tricky. It's really hard to figure out what's going on. Um, Although people have, I think people found them. Uh, people have argued that there's a kind of emphasis on on voluntary interactions and interactions of respect for other people and suspicion of state power that you get in Confucius himself. But really, I think it's the later uh, Confucians who come uh, uh, after that who are you know, sort of the clearest precursors of libertarianism. So I wanted to clarify. You said that. His students put together his writings for Confucius, so we're not sure. Kind of like Aristotle, sounds. We're not sure what exactly is original to him. Yeah, and, that, and that's the case with a lot of the early uh, thinkers. I mean, the uh, a lot of the early thinkers, the um, they have these this a book, you know, a, a book or two that will be their great work, and you know, often each chapter will begin with you know, with uh, for example, with Mengzi, each chapter begins Mengzi said, blah blah blah. Um, on the other with Shunsa, we don't get that anymore. Shunsa is a it might, might just be sort of his own straight uh, writing in his own words. It, so as, as, as time goes on, we have a clear idea who's doing what. But with the early writings, it's often not clear. And with Lao Tzu, we don't even know. Well, with Lao Tzu, we know virtually <laughs> virtually nothing about the author. Well, for and for another clarification, because um, I've studied a lot of of early Christianity. And I've read a little bit of Confucius, and it is sort of this poetic, elliptical, 
aphoristic kind of thing. And but some of the early types of sayings of Jesus, we see this too, uh, which is which is interesting by itself. Sort of these wise men speaking in elliptical sentences that maybe later people interpret. But also another yeah, and, and and with you know and with the you know with that we have the you know the a lot of scholars think that there's some early collection of Jesus's sayings that different gospels are drawing on and we don't have the original mm-hmm, exactly the original collection. and but and but the figure of confucius himself uh, did he ever warrant more divine type of respect m- more than a philosopher from his followers or did he always kind of stay a philosopher well he certainly didn't uh you know did not claim any kind of divine or semi divine status and i think he would have been you know uh, rather upset to find out that later generations started elevating him. The real elevation of him comes, you know, but later than this, he's getting sort of later Confucianism. In retrospect, he becomes more and more of a of a uh, you know, semi divine supernatural figure. But uh, you, you know, in early Confucianism, he's you know he's a great teacher. He's very greatly respected. But there's you know there's nothing supernatural uh, about the way he's portrayed early on. So the risk of asking something slightly off topic, but the, this this notion of writing in this elliptical way, an aphoristic way, um, raises something that I've long wondered about with Eastern philosophy. So while I have you, I'll ask. Um, I so I've not read a ton of Eastern philosophy, and part of that is because I find it very difficult to read and very difficult to get a like a mental grasp of in a way that I find relatively straightforward with Western philosophy. And it's often – it's that style that it feels like – and so tell me if I'm – if this is like an accurate characterization for one, that the writing does seem to be more aphorisms and metaphor and poetic as opposed to like the treatises that you get from say the ancient Greeks where it's I'm going to make an argument and here's the steps and I'm going to give support and I'm going to deal with objections and it looks like a traditional argumentative form um, and Eastern philosophy, I've read a decent amount of like Buddhist writings and it's it's a similar thing. It's like it's much more slippery and it's harder to see exactly what the arguments are versus the kind of poetic images. Is that is that accurate at all? I think that perception is an artifact of the fact that that Westerners who are interested in Eastern philosophy are usually looking for something different from Western philosophy. And so the the texts that are best known in the West uh, tend to be the more poetic, aphoristic uh, ones. But you can find uh, in both Chinese and Indian philosophy, you can find uh, you know, treatises that are full of of arguments and uh, you know, and you know, logic chopping and so forth, uh, the kind of stuff that Western philosophers love, uh, is just that those have have not been the texts that have been the most popular, uh, yeah, in the West, precisely because people were looking for something else. But uh, you know, I think, for example, in um, in uh, in China, uh, there's a philosopher named Moza. Um, uh, who, uh, you know, who's kind of a uh, yeah, utilitarian, semi-utilitarian, semi-contractarian uh, thinker, and his his works are just you know straight uh, arguing up and down. Uh, but that's one reason that you know he, he hasn't been that popular in the West, well, or in China either, uh, really, because he sort of became eclipsed by the Confucians and the Taoists. So Westerners are looking for. Sort of cliches of Chinese thought, and they and they find them. If yeah, that, if that's all they're looking for. Yeah, they want the things that look like a fortune cookie, or no. like the the guy, the guy who gives the mogwai to to the guy in Gremlins, like that. That's that's Chinese <laughs> philosophers, right? Uh, you actually write that. Uh, this kind of surprised me that the spontaneous order, the sort of Hayekian or at least Scottish Enlightenment kind of idea, seems to have originated, or arguably. It was first articulated in the Confucian tradition. How does how does that work? Uh, well, there's this there's this line in Confucianism that uh, for the the way for the um, the way for the emperor to rule is simply for him to uh, you know to hold still and let everything happen around him, which the Taoists say too, and that that is a uh, spontaneous order idea from the Taoists, but the Confucians seem to have said it first. Um, 
And the idea is that if, you know, if things are properly set up, you don't need to be tinkering with them and micromanaging them. Um, now, the, the uh, Confucians think that a lot, of, a lot of what happens can be done through uh, you know, moral inspiration. If you're a morally inspiring leader, you don't actually have to go around giving orders. You just sit there and you know, moral inspiration emanates from you and that inspires people to go do stuff on their own. But also a lot of the Confucians, uh, you know, some of the Confucians talk about uh, spontaneous order being created by market incentives. Um, uh, they were uh, fascinated, in particular, uh, Meng Tzu and Sima Qian, those two, were fascinated by by uh, market relations and by the way in which, without any central planning, uh, goods from all over the, you know, the world uh, end up, you know, People uh, traveling, you know, the people are able to enjoy stuff that came from the distant north and south and east and west, um, uh, simply as a result of market incentives. Uh, so that's not a moral inspiration case. The moral inspiration case is sort of the more famous thing that people know about Confucianism. But you also find this thing of just thinking that that market relations are really cool for this ability to produce order without anyone uh, uh, planning it. So were they free market? people like as we would understand that today uh i think so much yen comes pretty close uh, mungsa has a mixture of you know sort of free market and non-free market uh ideas um but uh but you know so much yen uh in so much yen you, you find this kind of uh this praise of entrepreneurs, it sounds almost, you know, a mix of Kersner and Rand and the, you know, his enthusiasm for, uh, you know, the ability of, of entrepreneurs to, uh, you know, to identify proper profit opportunities and, and so forth. And you also find in so much in a lot of criticism of government uh, uh, regulations. There's also a text uh, called The Discourses of Salt and Iron. Uh which uh, is a, a record of a debate um, during the uh, early Han Dynasty between the uh, Confucians and the Legalists about government policy, and the, and the Legalists were sort of, you know, constructivist, bureaucratic, top-down micromanagers who wanted to, you know. Unifying everything under common standards and so forth, and regulate everything. And the Confucians are saying, uh, "This is, you know, all, all these regulations have, you know, have you know, piling up the taxes and the regulations have impoverished the people, and they're they're supposed to be causing order, but they're just causing chaos. They just, you know, ease up, leave them alone, and you know, let people, uh, you know, let people do what they." Uh, what they want to do, and that will produce wealth and, and prosperity and peace. Uh, so, you know, there's strong libertarian themes there, even if, uh, you know, they probably wouldn't, um, you, know, you know, they might not, you know, you know, they might not check off every box on, on the, you know, on the libertarian quiz precisely as, as we might want, but they were, you know, definitely headed in that direction. Now, where are they coming from in terms of, like, ethically, if, we're, if we were to put them into a Western philosophical school for why they're supporting these free markets or at least observing that they work. I mean, they could be just completely observational and saying, "Hey, these markets work." But it sounds like they're supporting them. Are they are they basically consequentialists, or is it sort of a harmony kind of thing? I don't mean to completely bottle up Chinese philosophy with the word harmony as as a, as a Westerners want to do. Or are they? Is there like a rights theory undergirding this in some way? Well, they were they were critical of. Yeah, I mean, certainly, there are consequentialist aspects to their thought, but they're critical of the of the consequentialism of the Moists and the Yangists. So, to oversimplify a little bit, the Moists were sort of universalist utilitarians who said you should do whatever is is best for uh, for everyone, universal benefit. And the Yangists were egoists and said you should do whatever is best for your own personal uh, benefit. Um, and the the Confucians didn't like either of these uh, accounts. They thought they were too, um, uh, you know, too end justifies the means kind of approaches. Uh, they, uh, you know, the closest, you know, parallel. Lots of differences, but the closest parallel would be sort of the virtue theory you find with Plato and Aristotle. Um, this idea of a the the 
uh, the right way to act is a way that expresses the virtues, expresses what it means to be a properly functioning uh, a human being with the right source of uh, attitudes. The, um, now the Confucians also place a very strong emphasis on tradition, and this is one uh, reason that they're often thought of as being closer to conservatism than to libertarianism. Of course, it depends on on the details and the mood and so forth. Certainly, they were, were very strongly traditionalist. Uh, they thought that tradition embodied a kind of uh, historical wisdom. They were suspicious of innovation. Now, you can you can take that in the Hayekian direction, where it uh, you know looks more compatible with libertarianism, or you can take it in a more in a more conservative direction, and you could find those impulses pushing both ways uh, in Confucianism. Um, but uh, they they thought of tradition as sort of the you know the oil of civilization. That tradition is what uh, enables us to you know to interact without compulsion. Um, the fact that we share these uh, common traditions that give a kind of uh, a grace to our uh, our interactions. One of the maybe stereotypes of Confucianism, though, is this. So they're steeped in tradition, but also have a really strong sense of social hierarchy that would seem to cut against a, a libertarian interpretation. Yes, they. Uh, you know, they certainly were more into social hierarchy uh, than you know than uh, than we would like. Uh, they wanted the social hierarchy not to be. Uh, you know, not to be maintained by coercion, but nevertheless, you know, they certainly were uh, into it. They had their version of the of the golden rule says, you know, basically treat, you know, treat your ruler the way you would want your subordinate to treat you. Treat your subordinate the way you'd want your ruler to treat you. Treat your your parents the way you'd want your children to treat you. So it's it's like that. So the they you know they have these relations of reciprocity, but they build in you know this hierarchy. Uh, into it, and that's you know, that's a less libertarian uh, aspect of them. Um, on the other hand, they um, they also think that if people, when people uh, you know, act unvirtuously in fulfilling their social roles, they lose uh, you know, they lose the title to that respect of the role. So, for example, in Mungsa, there's a, a little exchange where the um, the prince is talking with Mungsa about some prince in a rival state who was, you know, who's overthrown and killed by the people. And uh, the prince says, well, surely you don't think it's okay to, you know, to kill the prince, do you? And Munster says, well, a prince is someone who, you know, who rules properly. Uh, I heard that they executed some common criminal, but I don't consider that they executed a prince. In other words, if you don't act the way a prince is supposed to act, you no longer have title to be considered uh, a prince. I mean, that seems pretty... Hardcore. Yeah, that, that's um, completely hardcore. Do they have some sort of view of the illegitimacy of power? Because I'm trying to also imagine uh, this, the the empires that they lived in. You said the, the Han Dynasty, for example. Uh, the rulers of these dynasties, they were they weren't were they divine right of kings kind of situation. Did they have a skepticism toward government power that also let them? believe in markets more? For example, did they have views on taxation that it could be wrong or illegitimate in some way that be, just because they thought the state wasn't fully powerful, imbued with godlike powers? Well, Confucians tended to favor low taxation. They, you know, they never, they never say that they're against it entirely. They had this, this idea of a, um, uh, you know, a roughly 10 percent uh, taxation should be the maximum. So there's like Herman Cain, like the 999 program. That pretty, <laughs> we didn't actually know where Herman Cain was getting that, and now we figured it out. We, we really sold <laughs> yeah. him. We really sold him short. Yeah, I thought it was Pokemon that he got it. From. Okay, that too. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was just that was just you know slightly uh, slightly to the uh, to the east of China. <laughs> uh, but the um, I mean, so the context here is you know, so we have first we have the you know the collapse of the Zhou Dynasty. So you've got all these these new little states popping up. Uh, it's called the Warring States period. Then you have a brief period where China is united under the Qin Dynasty, uh, really brief. It was like fifteen years. Um, and this was a period when the, the the legalists that I mentioned before, the top down micromanagers, became the dominant uh, ideology. That's the the Qin Dynasty is the one that be, that well they often say it built the Great Wall of China. Now what we have now is you know the the what we have now is is a later 
you know, a later addition to that wall. But I mean, they they built the original first Great Wall of China, and also you know the famous the famous imperial tomb with all the terracotta warriors. Uh, you know, that's from the Qin Dynasty. Um, the Qin Dynasty was overthrown. Um, and uh, it's sort of a nice story about how it was overthrown, which was the legalists had this view that uh, light offenses should be published, should be punished just as heavily as, as major ones. Because the idea is, well, you want to prevent all offenses, not just the, the, the major ones. And so all offenses, major or minor, should be treated really severely. So there was this group of soldiers that was um, – that was – supposedly making their way from point A to point B and they had to go through this swampy area and they were, they realized they were going to be late for you know for the point they're supposed to show up at. The penalty for being late was death. And so they said, well, you know, what's the penalty for trying to overthrow the government? Death. Well, we're we're definitely going to be late, so you know they had no incentive not to. No, so the, this is like. Well, we, we were going to do that. We might as well overthrow the yeah, government. This is, like, this is like the worry that you know the libertarians have raised about three strikes you're out laws, which is you know if you're, uh, you know if I'm going to rob you and and you know it's my third strike and I might as well kill you to get rid of the the uh, the witness since there's no you know since there's no worse penalty for that than for robbing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so and that, if the Qin Dynasty gets overthrown and they bring in a new dynasty, the Han Dynasty, so we, we, we do get a unified China. And of course, when I say unified China, the area that's unified is much smaller than what is China today, but um, you know, what they would have considered unified. You know, so um, uh, the... You know, so the early Confucians are writing, uh, you know, during the Warring States period, um, uh, before the before the unification. Um, then Sima Qian, the historian, he's writing uh, afterward in the these um, uh, you know the, these discourses of salt and iron about the salt and iron monopolies uh, is written during the early Han. So the early Han is, you know, the Confucians all agree that it's an improvement on the Qin. Uh, the Qin was a uh, uh, particularly oppressive uh, regime. The, um, according to the Confucians, the, the Qin dynasty burned lots of books and buried scholars alive. Historians are, you know, debate as to how much of that is, is true and how much of that is just, you know, the next dynasty, uh, you know, telling nasty stories about the previous one. But still, it does look as though, you know, if you look at who the political advisors were and you read what the kind of things the political advisors advocate, you think, well, it probably was pretty bad, whether or not it was as bad as, as they say. So, so uh, you know, so the early Confucians are writing during a period when China's not yet unified, and the later uh, later ones are writing, you know, after it has been. Uh, and of course, they all wanted it to be unified. Uh, you know, the Chinese most of the Chinese philosophers, it's kind of like you know, Renaissance Italy, where all the theorists are talking, "Won't it be wonderful when you know we finally get unified?" Uh, part of the reason they wanted this unification and centralization is that they you know, thought it would end the warfare among the states. But the Confucians didn't want unification to be done by military conquest, which is what the legalists were doing. They wanted it to be done by, uh, by you know, in effect, through competition, by having the the successful rulers be imitated, having the successful rulers uh, have everyone else come and want to uh, join them and want to... Uh, you know, want to be ruled by them rather than whoever else they were being ruled by. So they had this vision of China becoming uh, unified through a kind of uh, competition in in good in good ruling. So if they thought that there should be competition between rulers and that you should just move to the one who's doing a better job, and then if he starts doing a worse job, up and leave to somewhere else. That rulers were fairly constrained because if they weren't ruling properly, then they weren't rulers in the first place. They were fans of trade, fans of markets, um, opposed to coercion. They sound an awful lot like market anarchists. Yeah. The problem though is that they they wanted the competition to end with you know, the best one winning. Uh, you know, in other words, they thought you – know, they didn't think of the competition as an ongoing way of maintaining – uh, order. Although sometimes they begin like to look like they're moving in that direction, but most of the time they think that you know the competition is a way for the best rulers to end up in charge, and so you'll eventually have all China reunified under the best rulers. So they thought of competition as having a an endpoint where you you 
the best one wins and then you're done. That seems almost Nozickian and like overlapping security agencies. One single big one emerges due to efficiencies in the process. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, and no, I do. I think that they were uh, they were assuming that. I mean, they were uh, – I, I remember that the, the Confucians are coming, you know, the, they or their predecessors had been, you know, minor functionaries in the Zhou dynasty and they had it pretty good. And then came all the social chaos and the fragmentation into all these fighting states. And so a lot of them, I think, just assumed that the, you know, the best result was unification again. Uh, I don't think that they really thought of uh, – you know, there was something that's an alternative to you know, to both of those things. Um, on the other hand, uh, Sima Qian is a big fan of these. There were these private vigilantes who were sort of half bandits and half freelance Batman. cops. Batman. You should have said <laughs> yeah. Batman just for Aaron. We yeah, always they were, put Batman as much. They as were can. Batman. Uh, anyway, he he had you know. He's a big fan of them, and they you know they would offer their you know their protective services to various people, and he has perhaps a more romanticized you know, image of them than maybe accurate. Maybe Robin Hood is sort of the closest uh, thing. Robin Hood in the Batman costume, um, but anyway, that's a you know his enthusiasm for them is is sort of you know in entrepreneurs in in rights protection is a uh, you know you see that's an anarchist strand in his thought, even if he doesn't. Do we have any uh, idea? Through. Do we have any idea how many people in the, the living in normal people living in China at the time? Because uh, the Confucians, the ones we're talking about, they were occupying governmental roles mostly, or were they were they professional intellectuals? Uh, what were they well, actually they, doing? Well, they were um, uh, initially they were you know they were going you know from state to state trying to become. Officials. Once the Han Dynasty gets started, then you end up with a sort of bureaucratic class of uh, Confucians. Although the legalists were still around too, as a bureaucratic class, and there was competition within them. So, yeah, they're either they're either state officials or they're trying to become state officials for the most part. Um, are there are they teaching it? I mean, their universities? Because I'm trying. To, I want to know how many people, normal people, like the guy selling fruit in the street. Was a con was a Confucian? Would he, would any of those people have been like, no, I'm a Confucian? Another person would be like, no, I'm a legalist. Was that was that where the debate was also happening? The I mean, the vast majority of the population were peasants. It's not clear whether they were even literate in most cases. So I would I would guess that the average person had no idea what all this stuff going on. Um, uh, but you know, it's hard to say. They the uh, the you know the people who you know. Whose writings we have don't talk that much about uh, you know, what the average person uh, uh, was doing. Um, no, certainly we we find stories about you know someone arising among the peasantry who's some kind of a wise man or inspirational figure or something, and then various stories and doctrines will get attached to him. But it's it's hard to know how, how much of that's history and how much isn't. I wanted to ask about you mentioned this thing called the the well field system that was yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, so this is an idea that Munza has. Um, the uh, it's a system where you have a uh, you have a grid of uh, like a nine a grid of nine squares like a tic tac toe. Um, that's why it's called the well field system because the it has nothing to do with an actual well. It's just that the the Chinese character, the symbol for well, looks kind of like a tic tac toe. Um, and so the the you uh, so you have eight private farms centered around a the central common square. So the idea is that the um, the people all work on their individual. Each family has its own individual farm. Then the, the families together all cultivate the common farm, and then the uh, the taxes are paid to the state from the common farm, not from the private ones. So immediately, it looks like there's a serious uh, free rider problem here, because uh, you know if you know if the taxes are paid from the common farm, it seems like you have incentive to spend most of your time cultivating your private farm and not cultivating uh, the common ones. So a lot of people thought, well, you know. Munza seems to have a you know, bad economic ideas here, but you know, Munza says his reason for the system is to limit taxation. It's to make it at least that's one reason for it. It's, it's to make it harder for the state to tax people by saying that they can only tax the common farm. 
Uh, so I think that the you know the free rider aspect is sort of part of what he wants. And that is to say, uh, you're not going to spend a lot, a lot of time cultivating the common farm unless you really feel pretty, you know, pretty patriotic and pretty, uh, you know, you're pretty inspired by by uh, the existing regime and you actually want to give it some kind of support. So uh, it's a way of making taxation, as I see it, as a way of making taxation contingent on uh, the, the, the rulers doing a good job of inspiring the people and getting their support. Um, and so uh, you know, it's actually a way of... Uh, of, of of giving the people a kind of veto power on what the state is doing, and that the less the less inspired they are by what the state is doing, the less inspired they are to spend much of the time working on the on the common plot, and so the less taxes the state gets. Uh, that's you know, that. No, Munster doesn't say that explicitly, but that's sort of my you know, the impression I'm getting from what it's you know, what it's about. Listening to all this and and, and having read all this, uh, the thing that struck me t today is that this seems like a fairly individualist philosophy and a, and a lot of times and maybe this is just western ignorance or my own ignorance but when we think about china today and a lot of the east we don't really think about individualist philosophies carrying much weight they're far more communitarian in their discussion of society and the and the value of community it, did confucianism change I mean, first of all is it accurate to call it a pretty individualist philosophy and then has it changed to a more communitarian uh, as it, as it evolved into modern times, well, it depends what exactly you mean by those words, because there's a sense in which the Confucians were always very, you know, very communitarian. They're very social. They think that your um, uh, that you know your proper role as a human being has to do with your uh, you know with your participating in these very social uh, relations. You know, of course, that's not necessarily inconsistent with with individualism. I mean, Hayek certainly wouldn't think so, for example. And often, you know, often it's uh, you know it's uh, Hayek that one is reminded of in reading some of uh, of this stuff because you know, there's if you want an example of someone who combines the strong individualism with a kind of communitarian traditionalism, um, you know, because is Hayek an individualist or is he a communitarian? Well. He, he, these are aspects of of both, um, but it's interesting when you like limiting taxation, for example, uh, these kind of things where where it would seem that the reason you would do that is because you care about the individual. One of the reasons, uh, not wanting to take too much from them. Whereas if you were saying the community, you could you wouldn't have a view of limiting taxation. You'd just say no, as much as the community needs, kind of thing. Well, I think the thinking of the the rulers are. T you could think of it this way: the rulers are taking money from the community. Um, and you know, there's the rulers are supposed to have the interests of the community at heart, but if they, you know, if they're taxing all these people, you know, I mean, all the people together are the community, and the you know, the rulers are, you know, are individuals extracting money from the community. So true. Uh, true. So so maybe I completely mischaracterized it, but 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 the pr part of the question I said is Confucianism today uh, is it different? Um, in, in, a, in a meaningful – because it is still pretty popular religion if I remember correctly. Yeah. Well, I think you know, certainly Confucianism has, you know, has made its peace with the you – know, with state power a lot more than, uh, than it had in those days. And I think you, know, you can sort of see the process um, because initially the, you know, the Confucians are trying to get political influence. But eventually they get it. Eventually they become a, a privileged bureaucratic class within the state. And becoming a privileged bureaucratic class within the state does tend to you know, alter your incentives. And so uh, you know, I think the Confucians are at their best during the period when they still have to compete for influence uh, with, you know, with rival schools. Once they become sort of the established monopoly uh, within the state, you know, I think then – Although there's there are interesting continuities with the earlier tradition, they they become for one thing they become le much less fans of trade because the you know the early Confucians, especially people like Mengzi and Sima Qian, were really fans of of trade and commerce, and they're really impressed by the fact that that economic incentives were bringing these goods from all over the world. Uh, where later on the Confucians become very suspicious of of trade and travel and interaction with foreign cultures and uh, you know, in effect, uh, they you know, they end up sort of clamping down on on uh, China's economic relations with 
with other countries because because there's that period when the you know the Chinese are sending these giant ships all over the world and the Confucians were against all that they're against these trade yeah things the later Confucians were so I think that the Confucians lose a lot of their libertarian edge when they become a you know a professional class or privileged class within the state. So given how strong this libertarian edge appears to be for at least the early Confucians. Why is it that they then seem to get as little play as they do from modern libertarians and when we're discussing the history of liberty? I mean going back to the beginning, like the, the Taoists get mentioned fairly frequently as earlier proto-libertarians and the Confucius don't. But if they were this strongly libertarian, why don't we see more of them? Well, again, I think I'm not sure. I mean most most Westerners who've read any Chinese philosophy you know, have probably read, you know, Lao Tzu and uh, and some Confucius, maybe. So they, uh, you know, not that many Westerners, uh, you know, have read these other thinkers. Uh, yeah, well, I guess Mencius, uh, a fair number of people have read, uh, have read him. But uh, a lot of cases, they just not, they're just not that uh, that well known, and um, Sima Qian, uh, you know. Is not as as widely read as he as he ought to be. His history is just a fascinating. So why why should our our listeners uh, read them then? Uh, other than what you've said, I mean, it, it, you mentioned a bunch of it today. But what 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 additional thing do they bring to the libertarian tradition? Uh, well, it's just it's a um, uh, it's a contribution that isn't. You know that isn't this isn't quite the same as you know as either the you know the right space locking approach or the uh, utilitarian approach or the Randy and egoist approach. Uh, it's just a you know it's another approach that has some things in common with those other things, but it's uh, it's different. I think one thing that's interesting is that you know people a lot of people tend to think that libertarianism is a distinctively. Uh, Western value and that it's it's not appropriate for Asian cultures and so on. Uh, by by pointing out some of the uh, the aspects of this tradition, you can show that it isn't just a you know isn't just a Western thing. Um, now I, I start off with this tendentious quote from Ludwig von Mises at the beginning of the book. Uh, it says the idea of liberty is and has always been peculiar to the West. What separates East and West is first of all the fact that the peoples of the East never conceived the idea of liberty. The East lacked the primordial thing, the idea of freedom from the state. Um, and I quoted that because you know that's something that a lot of people believe, not just uh, Mises. Um, and uh, I think that. That it's products are simply not reading enough of the things people ought to be reading. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.